In the early hours of the 19th of December 1984, a car left the road and plunged to the bottom of a cliff on the rocky Kaikoura coast. The vehicle belonged to one of New Zealand's most notorious criminals, Ron Jorgensen, famous for his role in the country's first gangland-style murders. Well, it's rather a mystery. We, uh, we haven't found any uh, injured or dead persons at the scene. Ron Jorgensen had vanished and has been missing ever since. Had his colourful past finally caught up with him? There had been an attempt to run him over and that he'd been warned that he was at risk. Was Ron so miserable that he'd taken his own life? He felt his life had gone by and he hadn't achieved anything, he hadn't any money, and he'd lost everything and he was deeply depressed. Or had double murderer Ron Jorgensen outsmarted everyone that night? I don't see any evidence to support the fact that that wasn't a constructed event. There's no body, there's no blood. 26 years on, the missing re-examines what really happened to Ron Jorgensen and picks up a trail that leads across the Tasman. At 9am on the 19th of December 1984, two fishermen spotted Ron's red cortina on the rocks at the base of a 15-metre cliff. Local police initially assumed Ron's car had simply been stolen and dumped. Police went looking for Jorgensen to see if he knew what had happened and discovered Ron was nowhere to be found. Christchurch police were called in to help. We were called uh, by the local police who were concerned about the accident scene. They, they didn't believe that it would, uh, was credible. And uh, I went up there with half a dozen or so detectives to uh, carry out preliminary inquiries. Police had the car, but no body. No one knew if Ron had survived the crash or if he'd even been in the car. At the time Ron Jorgensen vanished, he was living in a pokey caravan at the back of his father's house in Kaikoura. He was on life parole and surviving on odd jobs and petty crime. He was painting a house belonging to a woman to South Bay, which is on the southern side of the Kaikoura Peninsula. He had access to the house primarily to water cannabis plants. The house was only eight kilometres from the crash site. The last sightings of him were at that house on the day before the car was found at the bottom of the cliff. A neighbour of the South Bay house saw him arrive there at 3pm and heard Ron happily chatting to another man. The voices were quite relaxed, quite normal conversational sort of tones. At 8.45 that same night, Ron rang his ex-wife, Margot. He said he was coming down to Christchurch to pick, a, pick up his gear from the house. However, for some reason, Ron didn't travel to Christchurch. And at 10 past 10, the neighbour again heard Jorgensen talking with a man, but this time they didn't see anyone. We were able to tie down the movements of all his acquaintances and uh, with alibis, etc., and we ruled any of them out. We have never uh, been able to determine who the uh, second person was at the address. The next piece in the puzzle occurred a few hours later, just south of Kaikoura. At 1am on the, the, uh, the morning, uh, a truck driver was uh, travelling north on the coast road. And he came round uh, the corner and the headlights lit up a Cortina car with the front wheels hanging over the cliff. There was a person standing by the car and uh, he was described as a, uh, a tallish person and, and he looked quite relaxed. He didn't look like someone who was uh, under any particular stress. We've found that there's nothing here to uh, indicate what happened when that car went over the cliff, so we'll just have to widen our uh, inquiries a little bit further. I hardly sort of gone into town before I sighted this sign up on a, a, a railway shed which said, Ron's gone, Ron's gone. <laughs> Everybody had a theory. 
There were those who didn't really believe that Georgie would have committed suicide or gone off the road. He knew the place well. There was quite a feeling that it was an engineered disappearance, that it was his way to get out, perhaps start a new life somewhere. Do you think there are people in Kaikoura that know for sure what happened? No, a lot of guessing. It's all guessing. His close friends would feel better if, he, if they knew he was gone. Mm. Yes, I think. If they knew for sure that's yeah. what had happened. Yeah. The case appeared to go cold. But about a month after his disappearance, a single clue surfaced. We used to sit down on South Bay and swim there. And my father used to like fossicking around in the stones. He always hoped one day he'd find the beautiful piece of green stone or a lovely shell or someone's diamond ring. And this day, of course, he dug up the hat, which normally, I mean, you'd have thrown away. But Mike immediately said, that's Georgie's hat. The hat was the final sign that Ron had been anywhere near the waterfront. Police were confounded there was no sign of Jorgensen, and if there was someone who knew what had happened, no one was talking. He had simply disappeared. To find out what may have happened to Ron Jorgensen, we need to look further back into his past. In every aspect of Jorgensen's life, there are clues that may explain his disappearance. The first and perhaps most obvious scenario to look at is murder. From an early age, Ron appeared to be destined for trouble. Growing up in Kaikoura, he liked to be known as the tough guy around town. My first recollection of Georgie was, um, I was I was going home to my mother, uh, or to our house, and Georgie came round the corner, and he was a lot bigger than I, and I was about, I suppose, eight or nine at the time, and he said to me, hey you, he said, the policeman's round the corner waiting for you. And I burst out crying and turned round and ran home. <laughs> That's my first impression of him. I can remember him boxing in Kaikoura. He frightened me, you see. Desperate to escape the sleepy seaside town, Ron left school at 14 and joined the Merchant Navy. Life on the ships was rough. Conflict settled with fists and knives, and Ron learned to hold his own. He would show me scars on himself and he'd say, oh, that was a bullet. And he'd say, oh, this one here was a knife. And he'd got them at sea, he reckoned, you know, in fights. <laughs> Eventually settling in Auckland, Ron struggled to find work and continued to throw his weight around. He would chew a matchstick and walk around the pubs and he'd come in and it was almost close to psychotic, and he'd see three pensioners there and he'd glare at them for a minute, you know, and then he'd walk out. And by